Will your flags? Jose, stage is yours. Well, thank you so much. I know I'm standing between you and lunch. Uh, I'll try to take the full time since we're running a little bit early, but uh, I definitely won't go over. Uh, so some of you may uh, know me. Uh, I've been in the industry for a long time. Uh, I did three startups in the CPAD space uh, starting in the early 2000s. Uh, Tropo was uh, the, kind of my last venture. We sold the company to Cisco in 2015. Uh, I then spent three years uh, helping kind of reinvent the WebEx platform uh, over at Cisco, and we launched that as uh, WebEx Teams. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, I've made now the transition to Twilio. And uh, I, always, I always wondered when I was joining uh, if the company was as kind of shiny and rosy on the inside as it looked on the outside. Uh, and I'm happy to report that it is. Uh, it's a great company. Jeff Lawson's done an awesome job, um, and I'm happy to be part of the team. Uh, so, uh, you know, I originally joined uh, as an architect at Twilio, kind of looking kind of horizontally across the company. Um, obviously, having an outside perspective sometimes helps to look at a company like Twilio and find opportunities to maybe make some connections or have products work better together. Uh, Twilio, much like uh, AWS uh, from Amazon, was built in kind of these vertical silos. Um, so each product line at Twilio kind of has its own little mini CEO. Um, and that works really well for scaling a large company. You know, Twilio is a 2,000-person company, but it doesn't feel that way because it's actually like 15 companies um, put into one. Um, but when you do that, you obviously uh, introduce some challenges. You know, uh, the obvious ones, right? People, teams are not talking to each other. In an R&D environment, you end up with redundancies, uh, which is always going to happen. But that's the price that you pay for having each team be kind of independent. Um, uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I'd never had that challenge at any of my own companies. We never grew that large. Um, so uh, I'm kind of learning at Twilio at some of these scale challenges as well. Um, I will be talking a little bit about the product that I work on at Twilio, uh, Twilio Flex. Uh, it's an interesting product because it's the first one at the company that runs horizontally across the entire stack. Uh, and so all of the challenges that I just mentioned about having to get teams working together, um, you know, we're facing them as well. Uh, and I'm happy to, obviously, after uh, any questions or um, I'll be around at lunch, um, you know, share some of those war stories. Um, I've only been at the company for six months. I may not have all the answers. Um, but that's not what this talk is about. Uh, this talk is about uh, a, an area that is kind of near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and it's, and I'm, hopefully I'm going to tell you a story. Actually, a, a good friend of mine once told me that a great talk is supposed to be either prescriptive, where the speaker has a very strong opinion about the way the world should be, and they try to convince people of that, um, or it should be inspirational. You should leave thinking, wow, like that's, that really changed my point of view. Um, this will be neither of those, actually. Um, uh, but, but I do want to tell you uh, a bit of a, just a story in my thinking. I, I've been in the industry for some time. I've made a lot of mistakes. And I think there's still a huge gap that no vendor, including Twilio, is really um, solving entirely. So I know there's some competitors in the room. There are probably some businesses and telcos that are looking for kind of white space in the market. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about that, um, because I think it'll be good for the industry for us to um, keep an eye out for where we're failing uh, developers. So I will get a little bit technical, uh, but hopefully uh, not too much. Uh, so, a uh, quick show of hands, this is not a CPAS slide or anything, this is actually um, a, a fairly um, a popular slide that talks about the transition from on-premise to SaaS and kind of the spectrum in between. Quick show of hands, how many of you have seen this slide or a similar one before? Okay, most of the room, right? And so, for the few of you that haven't, um, you know, on the, on the left-hand part of the slide, you have on-premise. And all the blue boxes are the things that, in a premise environment, you have to take care of yourself, which is everything. Um, and then on the right-hand side, all the way on the right, you have SaaS. Uh, so you can think of um, you know, any software product that you get, turnkey. Um, it could be uh, web-based or not. Uh, and uh, everything is red. So everything is handled for you. Um, and then you know, a little over a decade ago, everything started to change. The way we reasoned about how to put applications into the cloud um, and how to manage them and how to scale them up and the value and the ecosystems that can form around them completely got turned on its head. And it started with IaaS, 
Uh, no surprise there. You know, Amazon, AWS was one of the for, front, for, uh, front runners there, but obviously not the first. Um, and um, uh, in, in an IaaS environment, you have those four building blocks at the bottom, those four red things. So you have networking, storage, uh, compute, um, and then a way of packaging that compute in the form of like virtual servers. Um, you know, they call it virtualization here. Um, and this uh, has had a, had a major impact and has allowed companies um, like Uber, like Facebook, and the companies that came before them uh, to go from zero to completely dominating an industry, or in some, in some cases, creating a new industry without having to worry about the um, expenditures of building out data centers and, and doing all that. I'm not going to bore you guys with the details. You, you know the story. Um, what I really want to spend some time talking about is that third pillar. So, um, there we go. Yeah, so in, in 2009, I built my first application on a PaaS, a platform as a service. Quick show of hand, I don't know, there, there are probably not too many developers in the hand, but how many have heard of Heroku, at least? About half of you, great. So Heroku, um, in my mind, was one of just the great pioneers of PaaS. Um, uh, there, there was, there's a, there's a very a quintessential yeah, Kuroku thing where you, you build a web application and then in one command on your command line, you know, git, which is a source uh, control protocol, git push Heroku master. Just one very elegant line on your shell. You could copy and paste it from your website and just poof. Just like that, this web app that was sitting on your laptop is now in the cloud on a URL. You can hit it in your browser. You know, it has an SSL certificate. I didn't have to go get that from anywhere. And then with literally just sliding a slider, I can scale that app from one instance to 10,000 instances. Um, and I can even have them auto-scale it for me. And was, what, wasn't, what amazed me, well, were two things. One was the developer experience. It was just, you know, I was, I was uh, awestruck by just how elegant um, it was, how simple it was, but they still gave you all the knobs under the covers. Like, you can still see the logs, you can still see how everything worked, um, but they just took all the friction out of it. Um, so going back to our diagram, right? So what, what made PASS different than IaaS is we got a couple extra boxes, and, some of, and two of those are the most critical ones, right? They gave you a runtime with which for your app to run. So you don't get a server. You get a runtime, and this is this is a you know it's an opaque thing. You know they said, oh, we have some great technology. We isolate different applications from each other, but there's a lot of hand waving going on because that was their dark art. That was the magic that made that, that made the magic. Um, and the other thing that they gave you was middleware. Having this runtime and having developers focus on just the application, just the thing that makes them special, um, created the opportunity for an entire ecosystem to crop up. Um, and this is what made Heroku attractive uh, to Salesforce uh, as an acquisition. It wasn't just that they had a great technology that let you build apps fast and push them into the cloud. I'm sure that helped. But there were other companies doing that as well. But what, where Heroku really was successful was they built a marketplace of cross-cutting concerns that every developer would need when they're building an application. I'm building an app. That app is going to have to log things for debugging and troubleshooting purposes. Well, there's literally 150 companies that will sell you a logging solution on, on Heroku today, and they each have their pros and their cons and different features and different types of integrations. And for every cross-cutting concern, databases, telematics, uh, crash reporting, et cetera, um, there is a plug-in for it in the Heroku marketplace. Um, um, and they are uh, unparalleled today, uh, even to this day. There are many, many competitors in this space, um, but if Salesforce knows how to do one thing really, really well um, is to build these marketplaces, right? They've done it with their own Salesforce marketplace. Um, so obviously, PaaS then led to um, the kind of democratization of uh, this, this black art of being able to run applications uh, and only concern yourself with applications. Uh, and, and one of the most popular ones in this space is called Docker. Docker lets you essentially, a, a developer, write an application, package it up on your local machine into what's called a container, and I can run that on any platform in the, in the world that supports Docker, and it will run in the exact same way that it ran on my laptop. All the dependencies, including the operating system, is, or all the libraries needed by the operating system are bundled into this thing, and I can just bloop, pop it up there. Now, it's funny because, you know, what's old is new again. 
Um, you know, we used to call appliances, you know, were these things that you could package them up and they would run the same everywhere. Um, you know, Docker, I won't get into the technical reasons, it's just a better that. Um, and they just made it better. Um, but uh, we didn't stop there. Uh, how many, just again, quick show of hands, uh, have heard of serverless or you know, functions as a service as kind of a movement? Yeah, many of you, actually, that's great. Uh, so, so containers were awesome because you can package up your application and had all the dependencies, um, but they're still pretty heavyweight. You still have to deploy them somewhere, and they don't have as many guardrails uh, around them, so you can still get yourself into trouble. Um, and so there's been a new movement uh, in the space called serverless. And serverless essentially lets you write very micro applications. So you've heard of microservices, I'm sure. You can write these very micro applications. You can deploy them up to Google Functions or AWS Lambda or OpenWhisk, which is an open source one you can host yourself. Um, and you can build applications that are made up of, instead of, you know, used to be one monolithic app, well, and then we did microservices, so maybe that app is now 10 services. Now you can build applications that are made up of 150, 1,000 functions, and each one just does one little thing. And all of a sudden, you can start to reason about the performance and the scale and the cost of each individual feature that you're rolling out. Um, and that allows product managers and business owners to make really intelligent decisions about which features are working and which ones aren't. Um, also makes it a heck of a lot easier to debug and, and, and do a number of things. So that's about as tactical as I'm going to get. Um, I did, I did, I, now, I want to kind of switch gears for a second and bring this back to CPaaS, which is the topic uh, of the day. Uh, all of this focus, all of this effort and, and that I've been talking about as an industry um, has largely been in an effort to make mobile and web applications um, quicker to build, quicker to experiment, the ability to fail fast, and for small businesses, you know, like Uber when they were getting started, or pick your favorite um, unicorn these days, to start small and then be able to scale up you know, when, that, when that tail uh, starts going vertical. And that's the holy grail, right, of application development today. Um, and we're pretty much there. We're pretty much there with functions and all the things I talked about. You can have an idea. You can build it one day and then be scaled up to you know, multi-data center, multi-region, um, even collecting payment in you know, 150 different currencies um, pretty much overnight. It's like magic. It really is um, an amazing time to be alive in the technology space and in the application space. We're good on time, right? You gave me a look. OK. All right, good. Cool. I got seven minutes. I'm good. Um, great. So again, I want to pose a question. With all this great stuff about PaaS that I've been talking about, um, it's, it's easy to get yourself kind of confused. And you're like, well, CPaaS. CPaaS is like a PaaS for communications apps, right? Um, but I don't think, and, and again, I, you know, I think Raul's in the room here, and there's probably a couple of analysts that I'm not seeing here. So I don't want to get into a debate about names, but I'm kind of going to do that a little bit here. Um, uh, because I think what we've been calling CPaaS isn't actually PaaS at all. If you look at uh, most of the people, uh, companies in the CPaaS space today, um, I know communications as a service is like a different thing. I know Andy was like ranting about that earlier. Um, but just kind of bear with me uh, for a second. Most of the vendors in the CPaaS space are doing this, um, including you know, a couple of my own startups prior to joining Twilio. And what they do is they provide connectivity. So they provide interconnect um, so that you don't have to. You don't have to go get contracts with all these different carriers. Um, so they, uh, and you get the economies of scale of providing connectivity at scale. Um, you get address management, so phone numbers or SIP addresses or WhatsApp IDs or whatever it is that you're dealing in. Um, and then they have a set of channel APIs. And I don't mean to trivialize any of this. Like I know firsthand, and I know looking into the audience, uh, you know, many of you who I know, um, or I've seen at other conferences, this is really hard to get right. Um, and the best of breed here are leagues apart from the, from the ones that aren't. Designing a great API for web developers, that's attractive, um, and that works at scale, and then dealing with all the intricacies of like you know, carrier interop and SMS outages in pockets and regions of the world, this is all really, really uh, uh, tricky stuff to do. Um, and there's plenty of room in the market for, these, for many of these companies to exist. But it's not PaaS, and it's certainly not delivering on the same 
um, dream or the same, the same value proposition that the paths I was referring to earlier, the Herokus of the world, that they delivered for web developers. And so the question is, why aren't we as an industry giving communications developers the same level of attention and tools and stack um, that we've been giving web developers? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. One is, well, there's just more web developers. And so it just kind of makes sense that the industry would gravitate towards them. But I think the fact that we have six, you know, 600, 700 people in Amsterdam all wanting to talk about this era, um, I think the space is big enough now. We need to put on our big boy pants and say, like, communications developers are not, the, it's, it's not this niche thing anymore. It's not okay to just stop at this column number one. Um, and so I just recently joined Twilio, and I have kind of got on my high horse, and I started you know, making some of the same arguments. And as it turns out, you know, Twilio does have some products that kind of go above and beyond. We're not there yet. Far from it. Um, and I don't, want, and I, don't think this, I don't want this to be a Twilio pitch either. Um, but there are a couple key um, elements missing from our traditional approach. The first one is every communications app, um, if it's doing or even attempting to do omni-channel, like doing messaging with voice or voice with video, is going to have to deal with state, state management in near real time. And that is really freaking hard to do. Um, and so we need to be providing better tools for doing that. Also, um, you know, some of you may uh, heard to it, refer to it as orchestration, but we need to be better about um, providing higher level abstractions. It's not okay enough. It's not good enough to just have like, oh, a call and you can say things and you can play things or whatever. There are patterns emerging in the market. And if we can package up those patterns and make them available to developers, not as sample code, but as primitives within, the pla within these platforms and then allow customers to, um, to customize them. I know some of you do. Um, we need more companies doing that. And lastly, just like in the way that Paz did, I know that we've been trying to bend communications to feel like the web, um, and that got us this far. But I think there is an opportunity for a new class of CPaaS that allows developers to write communication code, which is just different than web code, um, and push that up into a container, a runtime, or whatever, and we can find ways to run that code close to the edge with lower latencies, lower to total cost of ownership for our customers. Um, and, uh, um, and I think there's plenty of room in the market even um, for us to converge on a set of standards um, and for us to evolve those things. Um, now at Twilio, we've, we've taken some of those concepts and we've packaged those all together and then we've built a contact center solution on top of it. It's the first of several, hopefully, of what we're calling application platforms. Uh, so it's everything that I talked about plus a fully working, fully fledged application UI, which, in, which is in itself programmable as well. And now I am dangerously running out of time, so let me just click ahead. Um, great, and so this is what Flex is. Uh, we, we took Twilio's, all of Twilio's channels that we support, WhatsApp, Line, uh, Apple Business Chat, SMS, Voice, Video, um, and on top of that, we built a, a drag and drop studio. It's called Twilio Studio. Pretty obvious name. Um, on top of that, we built a real-time state management system. It's called Twilio Sync. Most people don't even know that it exists. It kind of launched at some uh, Twilio conference, and we actually don't promote it very much, but it runs directly to that state management issue, and actually almost every product that Twilio builds today is built in, in part on top of this Sync uh, infrastructure. It's a global, real-time state synchronization infrastructure, and it's available to all of you as, a, as an API. Um, we, had, we needed it for ourselves, and then we just, uh, in, in typical platform fashion, we made it available to everyone else. Um, and then we built a series of workflow engines on top of that, Task Router being just one of them. Um, and then, lastly, uh, what makes Flex Flex, anyone can build a contact center on top of Twilio. We took a very opinionated approach of what a contact center of the future looks like. We built a beautiful, just lickable UI on top of it. Like, it's just like, you look at it and it's just like, oh man, like, I want to work in that app. Um, but we built it out of 250 reusable React components. So you can take Flex and make it look like anything you want, or you can embed Flex in any application, uh, any business app as well. Um, I want to, I'm going to skip this slide, but I, I want to show you, um, I want to show you a couple quotes. 
Um, Because I think this is like the power of what we're calling this app platform thing. So this is Jamie over at Lyft. um, And she says, there's nothing like flex in the market. We have complete control over every decision. And I'll tell you what, I went to go visit Lyft at their offices, and it really is amazing. And this isn't because of Twilio or because of Flex. Um, They have taken, as a company, they made a decision to take a completely different approach to customer experience. Their agents are not sitting in a contact center. They're literally sitting at desks with, you know, little plants and, and posters and stuff right next to engineers and product managers. I know I'm over time, give me one minute. Um, and, uh, um, and it's amazing, and it's amazing, and I think more companies should do it. Um, uh, we have a video on our website that I, I want you to go see, not because I want to sell you Twilio's, um, but just to see Jamie talk about customer experience at Lyft, it really, it's, it's, um, it's inspiring, it really is. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll leave you uh, on this last quote from Shopify, which I think it really sums up everything that I just said, that they, they, they could, they could wrap the product around their business instead of having to wrap the business around the product. And I think um, that's just a really cool quote, and I think it's something that I aspire to. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? We've got this catch box. This is a new one. Ah, please catch. Oh, no, you've got a computer. I could still try. <laughs> thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, what is the level of um, skills, capabilities to be able to wrap the, the Twilio Flex around your business? Do you, do you really need to understand something about telecommunications or you just understand the customer problem and then you can really develop actually without knowing too much about what's lying underneath? Yeah, so the question was, what, what do you need in terms of skills? Is that what you're saying at, at your company to be able to wrap uh, flex around your business? Um, yeah, and so uh, for about, I'd say 80 to 90% of the integration is just web UI code. Um, we took a very opinionated approach with Flex, and so we, we kind of went uh, full in on uh, React, which is a Facebook uh, web technology. Um, it's, I think, you know, by far uh, the, the, the most popular web UI uh, component technology out there. Um, but we do have some customers that say, oh man, like we're a FUBAR uh, shop and you know, we don't have React engineers. Um, we have great partners that can come in and help you do that if you don't have the right skills in-house. But to, the short answer is um, it's just web skills, like literally just web browser development. You don't need to know anything about communications. Yeah.